So understanding that when you are turned down, it's not personal. Don't mm -hmm. take it personally. Don't take it as though it's the end of the world and seek to get feedback. Ask, yeah. can someone talk to me about my proposal and why we were declined? Give me, you know, just some advice about perhaps coming back. Hello, hello, hello. It's Holly Rustic here with Grant Writing and Funding. And on the podcast today, we have Carmen James Randolph, and she is the founding president and CEO of the Women's Foundation of the South, which is super cool because the Women's Foundation of the South is created for and by women and girls of color in the South to advance gender and racial justice. So I just love everything about that. I love that you have created this amazing foundation. Welcome to the podcast. So good. To Thank have you. you. Thank you for having me, Holly. Yeah. And this is, this is twice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I love it. Cause lots of, we were actually recording this last week and you had a big thunderstorm in Louisiana and your power just, you just disappeared because your power went up. <laughs> so it's like, oh no. So we're rescheduled today and you're like, yeah, we just had a thunderstorm roll through. <laughs> so we're going to see how this goes. Awesome. Yes, we are. Uh, Fingers are crossed. In, are you in New Orleans or where in Louisiana are you? I'm in New Orleans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very cool. Very. I've never been there. I've always wanted to. It's on my bucket list. for. Oh, time. you must come. Yeah. You must come. Yeah. I've heard so many great things about it. So I definitely would love to go there. All right, so we're going to get into this podcast. And what I, what we, you know, we talked about um, all you listeners out there and, and what you guys are looking at with grants and all of the things. And we never really bring somebody on the show from the foundation side, from the grant giving side. And I love that you're on this uh, uh, podcast today to talk about that and all of your years of experience in, in foundation giving. So, yeah, I'm just going to open up the floor to you. Like, how did you get involved in this space? exactly what is that? All of the things. Okay. Well, I started my career um, working for a nonprofit and I worked for a nonprofit that served as a grant maker actually, but I, but also did programs, but it re-granted dollars from the NEH. So it re-granted federal dollars. I started my career working for a humanities council. And my role in that organization focused on the programmatic work. So I had to raise money for the programs that I was doing, and I had to learn how to raise money. And most of the dollars that supported the work that I did came from foundations, foundations and corporations. So learning how to raise dollars, learning what it meant to um, build programs and scale back and make adjustments and also apply for opportunities that might mean the opportunity to change or tweak what you're doing, all that stuff. I had that experience and developed um, in my career, starting as someone who was um, first doing the programmatic work, raising money to support the programs, and then um, went into leadership in that organization and then learned how to do everything from organizational budgeting, working with the board, so on and so forth. And that work led me to, when I was thinking of making a career change, um, I actually had an informational interview with, with a program officer who had um, supported my work from a foundation. And she asked me, why not consider philanthropy? And um, so I had the honor and the opportunity to move to a foundation that had supported my work when I worked in the nonprofit sector. And what was unique about that opportunity was I and the other program officers had all come out of the nonprofit space. Mm -hmm. And each of us had the opportunity in one way or another, to lead a nonprofit. And that was important because part of the ethos of the foundation was that we were to be partners. We were to be lifelong learners and listeners to community and be responsive to them from the vantage point of understanding what it takes to build a nonprofit 
as nonprofits go through in, incredible life cycles from perhaps being all volunteer driven to having one staff person, to building a team, to securing benefits, to growing its board, to preparing for a leadership transition in succession planning, all the things that nonprofits go through. I would say collectively, the program um, officers and my colleagues um, at the Meyer Foundation had experience firsthand, which made us unique in one sense, I think. And then another, we had, it was actually in my job description that I had the responsibility to be a leader locally and also nationally. So that was my first foray into working for a private foundation. I was there for some time and um, went from there to lead um, a community foundation as a vice president of programs. And working for a private foundation, working for a community foundation, understanding how those different tools of philanthropy are applied and also understanding how that work differs and changes when you are um, in a position to support multiple donors mm -hmm. and the will of multiple donors, which is the case of a community foundation versus at a private foundation, you have an endowment and um, you are grant making according to what the priorities are of that institution versus individual donors who might have donor advised funds or special funds that you are seeking to adhere and also shepherd the interest of donors. So I've had a, several different experiences I along love that. the way. Yeah, and I and I love that even from the concept of the philanthropy organization, the foundation that you first transitioned into as a foundation, and they only brought on, like you mentioned, leadership and people from nonprofits. And I think that's so important to mm -hmm. hear the voices and understand what are their struggles mm -hmm. in applying for grants too, and then be able to understand the opposite side of how to give it out. Because I think there's both on both sides. Sometimes nonprofits are like, oh, this is so frustrating to even apply to foundation grants, or we're not hearing back, that sort of thing. But on the opposite side, sometimes we're not hearing from the foundation, like, we don't have the capacity to review 300 grants all at once that just came in the door or whatever, and all of the things that go with that, like, we do have to have vetting processes, we do have to stick to our priority, we do have to have a way of scoring to make it objective. Like, you know, there are different things mm -hmm. that we don't hear about on either side. So, pulling in those resources that have at least one view, I think is very beneficial to the other side. But being in, in that, on the, the side of the foundation, then what are some common things that you addressed with foundation giving, especially with the knowledge of people being from nonprofits working now in a foundation? Like, were there any changes in how you gave out funding, how you recruited, how you advertised, like all the things, right? Just because of that knowledge. Well, I would say the first big takeaway was that um, our when I was at the Meyer Foundation, we prioritized general operating support and nice. we viewed general operating support as a capacity and capacity <laughs> building support. So in terms of having a foundation that's providing general operating support and another thing that was um, very unique um, at the time or just interesting about the foundation, we had a management assistance program mm -hmm. that basically had organizational development professionals, people who specialized in OD, working for the foundation and doing a specific kind of grant making that was targeted to help build the capacity of nonprofits. So there was a time we would do joint um, site visits and we'd talk to nonprofits and um, we, we discussed as a team, if we're giving operating support, what are the, are the kinds of things that we would like to know or that we would need to know or be in discussion with nonprofits about how to truly strengthen their capacity with this grant. So 
a site visit with me might look a little different. Um, I would ask about your board and talk about your board of directors and how involved they were in fundraising, if they were involved at all, and if they gave to the organization and how the board supported you as an executive director or your team in your fundraising efforts. It would look like talking about your ability to provide benefits to your staff. Mm -hmm. um, it would look like um, having conversations about your financial policies and procedures. Did you have written and documented financial policies and procedures that guided the organization? Um, and so just a host of questions that really address the infrastructure of the organization and not just to be nitpicky and ask those questions, but then where there were gaps or where people said, well, I don't know where to find this kind of information yeah. or I don't know where to start then to be a resource and to say, perhaps you should, you could consider this, or there is a resource available if you need help with developing X, Y, Z, or if you're considering leadership transition, if you're planning for your next chapter, um, have you had this discussion with your board? What are the thoughts around succession planning? Is there someone within your organization you could be grooming um, for this role? Or what is, what's the board's thoughts on who should follow you? So it, it was a very different line of questioning. It wasn't just uh, simply tell me about your programs, tell me mm -hmm. about your metrics. Have you achieved X, Y, Z? What's your theory of change? Blah, 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 blah. It wasn't just those kinds of questions, but mm -hmm. really how are you building this organization to be sustainable? Mm -hmm. And how are you building this organization to last through the natural kinds of changes that nonprofits go through? So I would say that vantage point was something definitely that over my tenure at the Meyer Foundation, working with, um, working alongside program officers who when I joined the foundation, they were more seasoned than I was in the field. So I, I truly believe that I learned from some of the best and um, had the opportunity to, to be alongside um, OD professionals that it, it, there was this moment in time, it, it became part of how we were thinking about um, grant making and supporting nonprofits that... Um, and in fact, Meyer had uh, supported several studies mm -hmm. looking at the role of the executive director, what the experiences were of executive directors, even breaking that down from just a general experience of nonprofit leaders to those of a particular age, of a particular gender, and also um, how those experiences look different for executive directors who were people of color. So it gave me definitely a vantage point that was pretty um, grounded in community mm -hmm. um, that shaped how it was that I came to um, the Community Foundation. I can tell you a considerable amount of my time was spent reviewing proposals. I had one of the largest portfolios um, at the foundation because I focused on um, youth development and education. You can imagine there was just a lot of groups serving kids and a lot of groups um, focused on education and education reform. However, I couldn't say yes um, frequently. Uh, just because of just the the number of requests far outweighed the dollars that we had available to give. So I would say I spent more time or or shall I say more of the decisions were no than yes. Mm -hmm. But because we had this ethos of being in partnership and being respectful and being um, learners and being in conversation with community, 
I did calls and my colleagues, we did calls with people um, to give them feedback on Wow. their requests. So That's amazing. if you, so if you were declined and you wanted to know why, I'd schedule time with you and we'd talk through your proposal. Truly, if there was an issue with the proposal itself, um, I would share that. And if it was just an issue of how do you make your, this request more competitive, I'd share that. If it were, are there any other funders you can think of that would be supportive of this work? If you all can't support it, I would think of that. And I would tell folks who to contact and so on and so forth. So it was about being a resource, um, whether or not groups were funded. And there were some non nonprofits that applied to the foundation, to my particular um, portfolio for about three years that I was very interested in, but it took about three years before we could get them on the docket. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's really interesting because that's something I've heard for the last almost 20 years is it's almost like a three-year cycle for especially a lot of national foundations to even get, like, you have to have three no's to get a yes. It's almost like a statistic. <laughs> it's so funny that you're saying that from this side. So, Mm -hmm. but and is it just your, are you looking like, okay, they're still here. They're still, it's like a part of relationship building in a very strange way, but it is, I think a part of that. Cause you're like, they didn't dissolve. Like that's one check we can have for them. Right. They didn't just ask once and then just like run off. Like they do think we're a good fit. So we need to investigate this a little bit more because they keep asking and maybe there's some things that we saw and we just need to see a little growth a little bit more in their portfolio before we could say yes like what are, is that some of the am I right in saying some of these things going through your mind or Some of those, and then others are just commitments. Like yeah for instance, if we make a multi-year grant to a nonprofit, there, there's a portion of our funds that are kind of tied up for maybe two years or three years. So if you're looking at um, a good part of your portfolio being tied up in multi-year commitments, then what you're able to do each year is kind of less and less until those grants, you either sunset them or maybe renew them at another level. There's all different kinds of strategies for making room um, to bring new groups in. But sometimes it's just the rhythm of, of what's available and um, when you're able to make room to bring on new nonprofits. Okay. But, but is it seeing Mm -hmm. that consistency and persistence? It does catch your eye. Oh, absolutely. I think, um, and I, I was interviewed not long ago and I, I said to a grant seeker who was asking a question, like one of the most important things I think to accept is that a no is not necessarily no, not ever. Now you as a grant seeker must do your homework and understand what foundations support You know, I had someone apply to me about doing something in, I forget, it, it was it was something bizarre. Um, and it's like, but that's not hardly what we prioritize or what we do. Why would this person think that, you know, they would come to us for farm assistance and Yeah. when we're not supporting um That's just not, that wasn't our area of, of a specialty or focus. So you do your homework, you understand what funders are interested in and what their priorities are and understand number one, the foundations are fickle. So you might find a funder that they have the same exact priorities and do their grant making the same for time and memoriam. You might find that some funders, they change. They might say, hey, we're in strategic planning. We're rethinking our portfolio. Um, we are responding to X, Y, Z issue. And they're adjusting their, um, their approach. They're adjusting their priorities. Mm -hmm. So doing your homework and understanding what funders support and what their priorities are and if there is alignment and ask yourself honestly if you say well i think this might be a stretch 
but I'm going to go ahead and apply anyway. And if you can apply and you think it's a stretch, but you can make a solid connection between the stretch and what that funder supports, go for it. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to apply and say, hey, this is a stretch, they fund youth theater and we're working with people who are in their early 30s and we focus on doing X, Y, Z. No, they're not kids, but kids like to hear this. You know, if it's too far <laughs> yeah. away from what that funder supports, chances are if you get a no, it might be no, not ever. And mm -hmm. if you get feedback and they tell you it's just not a fit, or if that's their what they tell you in your letter, it's not a fit, then perhaps it's no, not ever. Mm -hmm. But um, I will say for the most part, um, going back to my earlier example, I can't think of one program officer that doesn't say no more often than they say yes. Yeah. And we say no because that's unfortunately the position that we're in. It's not our money. Mm -hmm. it, these are sometimes not our priorities, but those are the parameters that we have for making grant decisions. So understanding that when you are turned down, it's not personal. Don't take it personally. Don't take it as though it's the end of the world. And seek to get feedback. Ask, yeah. can someone talk to me about my proposal and why we were declined? Mm -hmm. And um, give me, you know, just some advice about perhaps coming back. Um, and getting, having that opportunity or seeking first that opportunity for feedback is a good way of starting a conversation with a funder mm -hmm. um, because you might be doing something or you might be working in a way that, you know, you can talk through, but yet your proposal, it's hard to glean that mm -hmm. from the written word. You have the opportunity to um, show and talk about your, your work in a way that a proposal can't quite go that far. So I always recommend people try to get feedback as to why they were declined and then use that feedback to apply again mm -hmm. and um, go back, mm -hmm. go back. And if there's ways for you to connect with that funder, like if you might say to um, someone who you're getting feedback from, would it be okay if I added you to our to our distribution list and sent you our newsletter so yeah. you could understand more about our work. You know, somebody might say, no, don't do that. I get enough junk mail, but uh, some people might say, sure, go ahead, add me to this. Um, or say, you know, I don't know if you're on Instagram or Twitter, but we have a very active social media presence. I encourage you to follow us on social media so mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt to say those things to someone if you get a live person and you get the opportunity to give, um, to receive feedback, try to find a way of connecting them. Yeah, I, I love that so much. And we always encourage that to reach out, reach out, get your feedback, all of the things like, because it's so important and not everybody does that, like very few people do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we do see, though, is sometimes people do try to reach out and you're so great. And, you know, you're giving meetings with them, feedback. Unfortunately, a lot of foundations just do not do that. And it might be because they don't have capacity, but sometimes it's just crickets and it can be very frustrating, you know, from the nonprofit side of like, I'm oh, not absolutely getting feedback. Do you have any recommendations for that? It's hard. Um, I'm not going to say that this is a easy walk mm -hmm. and um, that it's easy to do. And especially when you're not getting any feedback. Um, certainly, I've been in that position as well as a grant seeker. Yeah. Um, and it's tough. And I would just say um, my biggest, um, my biggest, uh, point of suggestion is don't give up mm -hmm. and don't let one funder detract you from 
continuing to do your research, continuing to get proposals in. Some people say, oh, well, should I have a board member reach out to someone on their board or someone with um, who knows the CEO and da, da, da. Often those kinds of things don't work well. Sometimes it can backfire. Mm -hmm. And trust me, you don't want to be the grantee that um, a program officer made the grant begrudgingly. If you had gone through regular channels, qualified for a larger grant, you might get a smaller grant. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you might have been in position to be a regular grantee, it might have been a one-time thing. Um, you just don't want to be in that position. Okay, that's um, an interesting take. Yeah, I haven't really heard it that way, but I can see where that could go that way. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or trust me, there are times that each of us have been told to take meetings with certain people because of certain relationships. And it's, I mean, I've been in that, that predicament where people have taken a meeting with me because it was suggested that they meet with me. And sometimes you're not received very warmly mm -hmm. um, in those circumstances. So, yeah. It I could be that you receive a, a warm reception, like, oh my gosh, so-and-so has told me such great things about you. Or it could be, mm, so let's talk about what you're doing <laughs> with very little oh, interest in, right. in, doing, in someone's going through the motions with you. So mm -hmm. I will say that that the reality is this is tough. Yeah. It's, yeah. Just, it's a tough, it's tough. Relationships do matter. And where there are relationships, I would say carefully pursue those relationships, just handle it gen gen gingerly. But where you have opportunity to build relationships on your own, that comes from connecting people in some way um, mm -hmm. to your work. Right. And, and speaking of that, like, I, first, I just want to say, I love that you're just demystified a lot of saying, hey, I give out more no's and yeses. Like, this is a part of it. It's not personal. I know a lot of our freelance grant writers out there and the nonprofits, they submit one time, they get a no, they feel like they've got a sucker punch to the stomach and they're a terrible grant writer then. And I'm like, that's not it. Like there are so many other variables that go into this. And a no isn't always a no. I've had no's come back and give me $2.5 million a few months later saying, hey, we were able to wrestle up some, some funding. You scored really well. It just didn't go into the first round, right? Like that's just the reality or we needed to get more money. Like I've had that happen a lot, like not a lot, a lot, but you know, it's had to enough where it's like, it's a thing. So for sure. And yeah, we can't, you know, no's are a part of the strategy is what I always say as well as no's are part of the strategy. Um, but identifying really good fit uh, foundations and funding sources and saying, hey, their priorities really align with ours. Like that's where you spend time. And that's where it does take more time doing the grant prospecting. Like we don't want it to send out the same two page LOI to a hundred different foundations. Like that's no, you're going to get no's up yes. and down. But um, speaking of that, like building relationships off funding cycle, like that's another thing we encourage as well. From your perspective, does that work well? Because if we're just submitting every time a funding cycle is open, like that's a great channel to go with. It is a way to build a relationship. But when you're not having a funding cycle open, we can also say, hey, I'm working on this grant. I see this funding cycle is going to open up maybe in six months. Um, and this is a project we're thinking of submitting. Is it a good fit? Can you just give me some feedback? Like, is that a great conversation for nonprofits to call up those project officers and talk about off funding cycles? Um, I would say yes. Um, however, there are program officers who will take that call, who will respond. And unfortunately, there's those who will not. Yeah. I will say, um, in addition to that kind of outreach, I would also recommend that you consider ways of letting people know about your work. For instance, say you are applying to a foundation that supports um, movement building and power building. Mm -hmm. And you know that this funder um, seems to prioritize climate justice. Mm -hmm. And you do climate justice work and you're working in a very small um, community 
and you're having a real issue with X, Y, Z, and you didn't see anywhere in their materials where dollars are coming to your area. I would say that off cycle, if you're there's something that you're doing, if there's an activation of some kind or an event, you know, reach out and let them know that not to say that they will be able to attend or what have you, but let them know that XYZ issue in this town is the most critical issue facing your community for XYZ reason. Mm -hmm. And if it's not on their radar, um, you would hope that they would pay attention given their priority or their focus in climate justice. Like if you care about, or maybe not say if you, if you care about this, you'll look at us, but more or less, but if you just to put uh -huh. it on their radar and use all the tools that we have available to us now, mm -hmm. like for instance, I have sent funders um, clips of video from mm -hmm. events, um, we've sent them what's called a sizzle reel. So it's like, here's a sizzle reel from our event, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Um, in case you missed it, here's XYZ. I'd send links to articles where mm -hmm. um, events were featured. So, and then I've had some folks, you know, actually respond. Oh my gosh, I had a chance to watch your video or, oh, I watched that. I read the report that you wrote. Come talk to me about, you know, more about what you're doing. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much, especially like geographically, if they haven't funded a certain area, sometimes they might be like, oh, we maybe we should open up to that area, right? So that's also, I know that happens to us out here in Guam a lot. We'll be like, well, we haven't gotten any funding from that federal grant or whatnot for the last three cycles. So, hey, you know, like, mm -hmm. let's submit. so it's also just, and, and that's a good part of going back to a no doesn't always mean no. Maybe they funded four other organizations on the island last year, and that's a part of their three year funding cycle, like you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. So they're just, they're going to prioritize Puerto Rico now or somewhere else or another territory, right? So it's just, that's a part of those decision makers that grant writers and nonprofits don't often know, right? It's not mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So let's transition. Let's kind of segue into the work that you're doing now, um, which is absolutely amazing. So now you're running uh, the Women's Foundation of the South. You're doing a lot of work there and you're giving your grant giver now to those different organizations. Can you talk about that? And especially if we have listeners that are in that area doing that sort of work. Um, yeah. How they can connect with you and all of the things. Sure. One thing that I do want to say before I go into that, if it's okay, yeah, for sure. um, about grant writers, mm -hmm. and that is especially having the experience of having a large regional portfolio. If grant writers have multiple clients in a particular region and they're applying for grants on behalf of multiple clients. Ooh, yes, let's um, get into this. Okay, yeah, I know um, where you're going. Uh -huh. To a, a grant, uh, to a grant maker, speak in a different voice for each proposal. Because I've had the experience of reading four proposals that sound the same, that just had different names on them. Ooh. And I know that it's tough to yeah. do that, um, but it's so important that you understand the story of the nonprofit that the passion for doing the work um, that you're doing and their unique approach is captured mm -hmm. in how you are writing about the work and telling the story of, of their work. But I would just offer that. Even when I was at the Community Foundation, we had an instance where we had one particular grant writer that was submitting to our discretionary grant program mm -hmm. for about six different nonprofits. And it literally, you could line up each of those requests and they all read very similarly. Wow. And yeah. it didn't do each of those clients justice. Mm -hmm. And um, we had to make that point clear to the grant writer that, 
not only is it very competitive with, and we have limited resources available, but we you can't make XYZ organization sound like, you know, yeah. this organization. And it was hard to see and get, get understand how we would distinguish one body of work from another um, because it all sounded very similar. I so could, I, I could say that. Happen. Yeah, especially if they're kind of using boilerplates for them and they're, you know, so also you might see like the first three paragraphs are exactly the same, right? If it's something about your foundation, how they're writing it. So you probably be like, oh, spot that right out. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you know, we all write with a particular voice or style. And I would just say to um, take a moment to immerse yourself in the organization's um, communication so that you're speaking with their voice about the work from their perspective and what they care about. I just offer that. So okay. um, in creating a foundation, which I had no idea of how to create a foundation. And I certainly didn't do this by myself. I've worked with um, other women who are black, who are brown, um, native, trans, Muslim, white, and I would say allies as well to create the Women's Foundation of the South, to develop our mission, our vision, our values, and to develop the way in which we hold very dear to our hearts, how we approach this work. So a lot of what we've been talking about has been factored into how we approach um, building relationships in community, how we approach um, grant making and learning different communities, and how we have develop the values of the organization, both internally as well as externally. Hmm. I love that. I, I, yeah. And it's so good that you've like set this up exactly with what your mission and what your priority of funding is going to be as well and is. So that's so good. So for organizations then that are looking for grant funding, like what are some of, we talked about like your cause areas, but are these, like, what is your way of giving out funds? So there's nonprofits out there that are interested. They're hearing this. They're like, oh, yes, we fit in that. Maybe they have a gender and racial justice issue or a gender issue, right? A racial issue in the South. And they have that type of nonprofit. Like, what are ways, like, would you say, hey, reach out to us? This is how we do funding. Like, you've integrated some of what you said as far as being close to the community and taking those, those lessons from the foundation you were at mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, can you give a little bit more? Uh, Sure, sure. Well, we are, I think it's important to note, one, we are building this foundation as we are flying it. And that is how we're able to set our own priorities and do this work according to how we feel as a collective women and girls of color in the South should be and need to be supported. Mm -hmm. So that's the benefit of not having been started with a large gift from a donor, whether that person was dead or alive, and basically developing our programmatic work and our grant making focus based on their priorities and their mm -hmm. vision of, of what their legacy would be. Mm -hmm. And it's just important to understand that most foundations are looking to support the legacy of whether it is, um, you know, Mr. Kellogg or whether it is um, the a, a donor who, or a family yeah. that has shaped the foundation. Mm -hmm. So this is different in that we're building it. So it is truly the collective gifts of individuals. It's the collective gifts of institutional partners, um, whether they be um, foundations and corporations that have that have built the foundation. So mm -hmm. we're in our third year of operating. And just being in our third year, we've raised mm, 
more than six million dollars to support this work in the last three years. And we have committed more than a million of that for grant making and regranting, as well as our programmatic work. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, if you consider this first three years being our R&D phase, our research and development phase, we're learning from community. And at the same time, we're trying to pour into community and resource nonprofits that support women and girls of color in the South. So mm -hmm. we are supporting leadership as well as learning from them at the same time as we raise money. So this is mm -hmm. our approach. Um, we'll see if it works, but this is how we are going about this work. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how we fund right now, it is invitation only. Mm -hmm. So I would say pay attention to that. If funders yeah. say, you know, it's invitation only versus over the transom. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that we don't want to know about your work or know about who you are, what you're doing. Um, certainly. Um, reach out, let us know about your work. There are a couple things that we do. Um, even though we've only have done grant making uh, thus far in four states, um, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, and Georgia, our plan is to expand state by state to our entire 13 state footprint over the next five years. And, um, but we are focused in strategic communications. So we highlight the work of nonprofits. We highlight the work of exceptional leaders and not just groups that we fund. So mm -hmm. for instance, we highlighted the work of the two young ladies who address period, period poverty in mm -hmm. Alabama. We're not yet in Alabama, but we highlighted their work. If there's a way that we can give you shine, if there's a way that we can amplify what you're doing, um, certainly we were, are open to that. And if we, once we come to your state and we do our due diligence as to who's, who's working in community, we certainly would like to involve you. I, I love that so much. And, and just looking at that too, to say as a foundation, it's not just that your money giving foundation, like a funding foundation, you're also looking at your overall priority and cause area to say, we want to lift this up. We want to create a movement. We are creating a movement. We are having mm -hmm. impact. So even if you don't come to us for money, like let's join hands. If you're doing similar work, if you're out there, how else can we support you in those types of ways? And I think that's so important because most foundations I believe they are really set up driven by priority and it's not only the, the funding, but nonprofits kind of get stuck in, oh, they're just a grant maker. You're not just a grant mm -hmm. maker, right? You're not. So no. I think it's important mm -hmm. to know. And I love that you're doing that. Well, foundations can do more than just give grants and mm -hmm. um, foundations can use their voice um, in terms of their voice for leadership in a particular area. Foundations have convening power and foundations also have strength and in terms of communications, more than just using their voice, but just in terms of their reach, helping to extend the reach of messages. And I think that there's multiple ways to engage foundations. For instance, we had a group come to us to say, you know, now that the Dobbs decision has happened and reproductive rights are being stripped from women and there are trigger laws in place in our state of Louisiana and neighboring states, you know, we feel that women of color are being left out of this dialogue. Mm -hmm. And some of the solutions that are being discussed will not work for our community. We're mm -hmm. not interested in being criminalized. No. Um, that wouldn't work because of, you know, just our our history in this country. And there's a lot of fear around mm -hmm. this. So can we come together as women of color and discuss this issue? Will you hold space for us? Yeah. So we held space for brown and, and black women. Um, we we 
had translators there and unfortunately not enough because our the poor translator who was there was wore out we had so many we needed more in the yeah. room but to, to hold space for that dialogue for mm-hmm. women to talk about these issues um uh, across so to speak racial lines and just talk through what the issues were as they saw them in their community and why reproductive justice for them wasn't, not that abortion wasn't a part of it, but that wasn't the centerpiece. For right. many of them, it was about housing. Mm-hmm. It was about affordable and safe housing. It mm-hmm. was about pay equity. They're like, if we have so many women who are dying in childbirth, mm-hmm. can we address maternal mortality? Mm-hmm. Can we focus on that issue of having a safe and healthy birth right. or just even access to prenatal services. Mm-hmm. So yeah. holding space was a very powerful role for us to play. And that's what we did. We just provided the space. We provided the translation support. We provided food and the physical place for people to gather. And it was powerful. Mm. So I just say there's multiple ways to engage um, foundation partners. Yeah, that is so, so good. I'm so glad you're doing the work that you're doing. It is really important, um, especially in these days, right? Like there is conversation. There's so much that needs to be said about that. We've also had our work here on Guam with that as well, um, you know, to talk about reproductive justice and how important it is. Um, we're very far from anywhere. It's very expensive to fly. If you need to go get an abortion, all of the things it is, it's impacting people at different socioeconomic levels in ways that people don't even understand who are mm-hmm. making those decisions. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. We need to hold this space and talk about it. And then to have solutions from the people who are impacted completely, right? Just to be able to talk about their fears, mm-hmm. to talk about what can be done, right? So I just applaud you in holding that space because that's really important. And for people out there, grant writers to know that foundations do more than just grant funding, that those are ways like you're creating movements, you have priorities. Funding is one of the ways of implementing some things, um, mm-hmm. but there's so much more. So I thank you for sharing and coming on today and talking about all of the things that you guys are doing and just your background as well. So I think that's really really important um, work that you're doing. And also, are you also in the Women's Foundation of the South? Are you also focused on more general ops as well? Or have you carried that kind of um, over into your work? Um, it will be. So right now we're focused on raising money. So yeah. we're yeah. raising, we're raising, it, we're raising capital. Mm-hmm. And it's our hope that we will be able to provide critical general operating support in addition to the uh, restoration grants that we're doing now. Nice. Um, presently, we're focused on leadership development and restoration, looking at um, that lens of healing justice for yeah. our work as just the way in which we want to approach community. Mm-hmm. But um, there will be a day, that day is coming, where WFS is fully capitalized and making meaningful, robust general operating support grants to organizations serving women and girls of color in the South. I love it. I love it. And yeah, and for those people listening too, you may be considering being an investor. So how can people find you, whether they're looking to just collaborate with you, maybe looking at just submitting for a grant application or um, becoming an investor, where can they find you? Please visit our website at www.womensfoundationsouth.org. You'll see a pop-up to receive our newsletter. I encourage you to connect with us. We would love to share our monthly newsletter with you. And also you can follow us on social. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I love that so much. And we'll have all of the links in the show notes if you guys want to visit the show notes as well. But just for you guys listening, you might want to jump over there right now. So we wanted to make sure they have that URL. But thank you so much, Carmen, for coming on the Grant Writing and Funding Podcast. This has been so good. Yes. 
So this good. has been awesome. Thank you, Holly, yes. for hosting Thank us. You. Yes. Yes. And we'll, we'll be sure to have you back on because <laughs> I want to hear what's happening a year from now with everything. So yeah, so definitely we'll have you back on. But thank you so much again for talking about all, all of your experience. And I know this is going to be so helpful for so many grant writers out there. So thank you so Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me.